Hello and welcome to this presentation, Perspectives on the London Skyline, The Shard and Big Ben. The aim of today's presentation is to evaluate, compare and contrast the advanced construction technologies of these two iconic London Tower buildings. Taking each project in turn, we will consider the scope, site and substructure systems, superstructure, services and special features, sustainability, ending with summary reflections. God collects historical perspectives of a once spire-filled skyline and recreates this visual dominance with tapering shard-like glass facades that reflect the changing mood of the sky. Distinct from one another, the irregularity of the shard is inspired by the chaotic constraints of the area from which it rises, the heart of intersecting river, road and rail networks of the London Bridge area. Irvin Seller's vision was catalyzed by planning incentives for high density development at major transport hubs. Enlisting architect Renzo Piano he wanted to achieve an iconic internationally recognised design, accommodating high-end public, commercial and residential spaces, creating a vertical city. The constraints of the project were multifaceted. The goal was to complete in time for the London 2012 Olympics. A change to a fixed price contract and a high quality finish kept all corners of the iron triangle of time, cost and quality constantly in play, making construction speed centre stage. Some key risks and constraints included scale and complexity, building movement, congestion and access, weather, planning challenges, political barriers, cost forecasting, the 2008 recession, and just the very high levels of collaboration required. Strengths of the site meant extensive enabling works to improve access and utility provision, along with remedial works to railway infrastructure. A third of lorries struggled to get to site on schedule, which put project timescales at risk. The existing underreamed board piles of the demolished Southwark Towers were insufficient to incorporate into the shard foundations and too expensive and time consuming to remove. The interplay of these multiple constraints created a giant logistical operation run with military precision. A 53 metre deep second pile wall was embedded on the basement perimeter all the way down to Thanet Sand Strata. Similar to a cofferdam, this acted as a watertight barrier against ingress from water saturated London Clay and Lambeth Group levels. Further, it provided immense structural support to the substrate to reduce the risk of local building movement. The shard substructure was an immense feat of construction technology, innovation and risk. When the contract change delay happened, a never done before approach saw the substructure core jump started. While the substructure core was still being built, the first major core constructed top down in the world. This regained the three months lost and shows how project pressures and constraints can drive innovation and creativity. Steel plunge columns to the same depth as a second wall supported the piled raft concrete foundation slab. The ground floor slab was laid and excavation made to level two of the basement where the slab was cast and the slip form erected to jumpstart core construction. Initially, the core could only be built to level 21 because of a load limit on the piles. Concrete walls were then cast to fill in the plunge columns beneath the core, transferring loads to the raft, enabling the core superstructure to keep climbing to level 73. 
site congestion constraints were exemplified by the poor. Remarkably, 5,500 metre cubed of concrete was poured over a 36-hour Easter weekend when there was less traffic. Separation of the 65,000 metre cubed of excavation and concreting also de-risked that part of the project, involving 25,000 man-hours without a single accident. The slip form allowed faster construction in contrast to jump forming where shuttering is attached and reattached in stages. The core houses 44 lifts, 2,000 tonnes of reinforced bar and 12,000 metre cubed of concrete at a total height of 259 metres. A signature feature of the shard is its invisible hybrid structure. The lower office floors were made from steel, concrete to level 69, returning to steel again for the 23 storey spire. This was a value engineering approach by WSP, allowing smaller ceiling heights in the concrete hotel and apartment section where services could be run in corridors. It improved commercial outcomes for the client by creating two extra rentable floors. The steel structure provided quick, accurate all weather construction and the more time-consuming concrete levels offered another two levels by obviating the need for a tuned mass damper, saving millions of At 530 tonnes, the modular construction of the 60-metre spire spires shards and floor plates around a central mast allowed a quicker and safer construction at height. The speed was maximised by a dress rehearsal off-site in a field in Yorkshire, by fabricator Severfield Reeves. An innovative approach to crane use optimised build speed. Initially, four ground-based tower cranes were used to 162 metres when an innovative solution attached, attached a tower crane to the rising slip form itself, saving time from repeated core reattachment. 70% of crane time was lost due to bad weather, so the modular construction of the spire was very effective in relation to the construction efficiencies that were needed. The signature low iron triple glazed glass facade involved, involves 11,200 panes and 56,000 square metres. While curtain walling is a flexible finish, it was clearly chosen for its signature appearance. Twelve building maintenance units enabled cleaning and maintenance to the whole facade, compacting away in garages at level 72. Double-decker lifts travelled through the core to level 34, with 44 operable lifts in total. Special features of the shard are the viewing gallery and winter gardens inviting fresh air through smart openable glazing sections, adding to the building's sustainability credentials. Overall, the project achieved a Bream excellent rating, embedding low carbon and high energy efficiency into the design. The triple glazing provides a ventilated inner cavity and smart blinds maximise daylight while reducing interior heat gain. It reduces the sun's heat by 95%, but minimises the need for air conditioning. The building also has its own heat and power plant to respond to diverse energy demands across the building. Overall, the shard requires 30% less energy than typical tall buildings. 95% of construction materials come from recycled sources, including 20% of the steelwork. The engineering processes in the substructure also increase sustainability performance including the thinner raft and the use of ground granulated blast furnace slag, reducing 800 tonnes of carbon. These features show that sustainability can work in concert with design and engineering when embedded in project objectives from the outset. The Shard ended up a 12 year project, taking three years to construct. It represents a vast collaborative effort 
traversing the overlapping terrains of political and legal contexts, of policy and planning battles, and the economic and social pressures of a public inquiry and a UK recession. Further, the technological requirements and environmental considerations of a never-done-before building on a constrained site were immense. The odds stacked against the project were great. The underpinning commitment to the owners and architects' vision, along with a structural commitment to collaboration across a huge, diverse, multi-layered team, enabled ultimate success. At the heart of this collaborative effort was a can-do mentality that bred an ability to accelerate the programme when needed through innovation and creativity. Much like the building itself, the opposing forces of design, cost, quality and time were engineered together in tension to produce a building that represented the beauty of the project itself. The London 2012 Olympics were set in the backdrop of towering shards that pierced the London skyline. Now we move on to our historical tower building, the Elizabeth Tower, colloquially known as Big Ben, which will mainly focus on its current restoration. While there are no records, an original clock tower was said to be built on the site in the 13th century. Big Ben as we know it today is connected to the Palace of Westminster, which was built after a great fire in 1834. The current restoration of Elizabeth Tower began in 2017. In its original construction, high quality brick, stone, slate and glass were transported by boat and road from across the UK and beyond, with many skilled craftspeople involved. The tower was built from the inside out. A gantry on top of the tower with winches meant no scaffolding was needed. This presents some technical and visual comparisons with the modern slip form technique that built the core of the shard. The 16 years it took to fully complete the original tower represents the constraints on the speed of construction in pre-industrial and technological areas using lovingly laboursome techniques. The clockmaker Augustus Pugin remarked before his death about working with Barry, the original architect. I never worked so hard in my life for Mr. Barry, for tomorrow I render all the designs for finishing his bell tower, and it is beautiful. Located in a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the aim of the five-year, £61 million biggest restoration project in Big Ben's history is to restore the Grade 1 listed tower to its former glory and modernise it for future generational longevity. Within this overall project objectives, goals included a minimally interventionist approach in order to retain the original fabric of the structure, conservation excellence in repair methodology and material replacement. Purcell were procured as the conservation architects with Sir Robert McAlpine as the main contractor. Increasing the tower's safety standards were also core to the project and the use of building information modelling which will also provide a digital legacy for future restoration work. Specific works included clock repairs, conserving the roof and heritage features, interior refurbishment, renewal of building services and systems, and increasing the energy efficiency. A pestle analysis reveals the breadth of unique risks and constraints associated with the project. The political and social profile of the building, public as it is, brings certain economic and political accountabilities around project costs and value for money. 
While the icon is a much-loved British symbol of the nation and its democracy, effective management and justifiable expenditure is required. This highly public setting also brings a spotlight that adds to the pressure and pride of those involved in the works themselves. And to this add the main technological constraints of accessing a busy, congested site and difficult to reach parts of the building with incomplete records. As such, the full extent of the material deterioration was not able to be fully known until the project was underway. This also contributed to time and cost uncertainties. Comparable to the restricted and congested shard site, Big Ben is similar. Added to this was the tiny building footprint of only 12 square metres. Like the shard, these constraints made the precision of project management and scaffolding accessibility crucial to project success. The slowly changing ground conditions since original construction were worse than expected after intensive surveys which contributed to an original increase in projected costs from 29 million to 61 million. Coordination of construction adjacent to the main pedestrian thoroughfare was also a challenge. One of the most complex scaffolds in British history, costing £3.5 million, 800 tonnes of layer was installed by PhD Modular. Taking over a year, it involved 23,500 components, 47 lifts, and covered a total end-to-end -end distance of 20 miles. A temporary roof was recently uncovered and top-down dismantling will continue as the restoration progresses. The rig is freestanding, so no further damage or loads were applied to the tower. Extreme care is needed. The layer system scaffolding is a pre-configured modular system, more lightweight and uses end-to-end -end digital process with software that corresponds to BIM. Although it can cost more up front, the logistical efficiencies reduce time and therefore costs overall. Constraints around access and logistics are exemplified with the roof restoration. Deterioration and World War II bomb damage to the cast iron roof structure that was only fully visible when scaffolding was erected and tiles were removed. Each of the 3,433 tiles were hand restored in a North England workshop along with the decorative cross, orb and Ayrton light. The gilding technique adds gold leaf to decorative features and is highly durable. Expensive and painstaking to apply, it adds the glistening glow to the crowning glory of the tower top. The stonework was also more damaged than expected from air pollution and wind erosion. The quality of every piece was studied and in total, 700 hand-carved replacement segments were used crafted at an on-site facility at the tower base. Deterioration and bomb damage had also impacted the great clock dials. A specialist team removed and replaced all 324 glass panes and dismantled the entire 12-ton clock for the first time, lowered by winch. Colours were restored to their original architectural designs. Previous to the restoration, the tower was only accessible by a single spiral staircase. The original ventilation shaft from basement to belfry was used to install a lift to improve access for both maintenance and evacuations. The use of BIM has now provided a complete digital catalogue of the building, which will make maintenance and refurbishment much more efficient for the future, one of the constraints of the current project. All the m and &E engineering designs are provided by SI Sealy, including health and safety improvements and a fabric protection heating strategy, 
contributing to the improved sustainability performance. While the sustainability credentials of Big Ben are improved by the new energy efficient heating system and lighting, and the gilding, for example, is a more sustainable restoration process, the entire project should be viewed as a sustainable endeavour. It is by nature environmentally integrated and the very purpose of the project is to restore and preserve the iconic tower for future generations. It has endured over 150 years of environmental erosion and sociological damage of a world war and weathered the test. In continuing to enjoy this heritage landmark, Sustainable responsibility demands its preservation for future generations. The political, social and economic dimensions to sustainability are all in play. Project costs originally projected at 29 million rose to 61 million and are now estimated to reach almost 80 million. Reporting figures to Parliament, the government faced opposition and disdain, while understandable, appreciating the specific constraints of the restoration, as discussed, is a mitigating factor. Access and logistics hindered the discovery of asbestos and the extent of pollution and war damage. Legal and health and safety requirements also required uh, you know, strong involvement in the works. Previous restorations, while lacking advancements in current techniques, methods and digitisation, were below the quality that the structure, it could be argued, deserved. In turn, was this in part due to the economic austerity of the post-war years, as reported? The very public nature of the tower and these political and economic realities remain present to the restoration project today. Was presenting an underestimated project cost at the outset in part a political approach to overcome the political and social barriers? More clearly, though, is the convergence of political, economic, social, technological and legal factors that show how sustainable development is a multi-dimensional issue, but issues that must be overcome to preserve the past for the future. The project is due for completion by summer 2021. There are a few further aspects of the two tower projects that can be compared and contrasted. They're both tower buildings. The Shard had a top-down core and Big Ben underwent a top-down repair. They both used BIM and they both had significant access issues. Cranes in a slip form were used for the Shard, scaffolding in a gantry for Big Ben. Both on a congested site and both iconic buildings. It could be said that the commercial pressures were the greatest in the Shard project, whereas maybe the political pressures came to the fore in Big Ben. The overarching unity of the projects, however, lies not so much in their common stature as London Tower buildings, but these barriers that were overcome in achieving project success. The Shard represents a modern, privately owned building on the London skyline, constructed with modern materials and methods. The Elizabeth Tower represents a historic, publicly owned building, restored with heritage materials and methods. Both were made possible through a large, creative, collaborative and digital effort. Whether public or private, old or new, common pestle barriers present themselves in different guises to both and maybe all advanced construction projects. The Shard and Big Ben demonstrate the timeless aspiration and resilience of the democracies, societies and collaborative communities that built them. And they serve to remind us whatever changes and barriers we face, to keep reaching forwards and looking up. Thank you for listening.